thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, with us today one of our, my colleagues, uh, Ahmad Daboul. Um, he's a CPA. Uh, he actually did a presentation um, to our entire staff, uh, sort of talking about uh, one of the big things we're going to have to uh, update and change this year for our T4 process as sort of our internal pr uh, process. And I thought he did an amazing job on that. So I wanted to give him the opportunity to come out and uh, share with you guys the implications of what the new wage subsidy program is going to have on both the T4 process uh, as well as the new form, which is called the PD27 form. Uh, and this is a form uh, that anyone who has applied for the wage subsidy, uh, whether it's the TWS, the temporary wage subsidy, or the CEWS, uh, Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, uh, you would need to complete as soon as possible. Uh, so we'll be talking more about that, but I think Ahmad, you were gonna you were gonna just kick us off with the discussion about the different wage subsidy programs, what they are, and how they work. Correct? Sure, definitely. So thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to join you today and Andrew to be walking you through the presentation subject, how to prepare 2020 T4 slip and uh, the new PD27 form. So as some of you may know already that 2020 CRA is requesting additional information to be reported on the employee T4 slip. And that is related to the two subsidies program that were launched in 2020 back after March when the pandemic started. The main two subsidies programs are the 10% temporary wage subsidy and the Canada emergency wage subsidy. So we'll shed some lights on these two subsidies programs also because, because they are uh, directly related to the new requirements by the CRA. So on the agenda today, first we'll uh, be shedding some light on individual and uh, business different wage subsidies that were enacted or launched uh, during 2020, uh, just on a high level uh, scale. Then after that, we'll move to see how the 10% temporary wage subsidy works. Uh, also how the Canada emergency wage subsidy works. These two wage subsidies are employers related. So they work together because they are interrelated and eventually they lead to the same benefit received if you apply, if you choose to apply and if you are eligible for both programs. So after that, we will come to the subject of this presentation, the 2020 new reporting requirements and the additional four boxes that are required to be filled in the T4 slip. Plus also, if you are taking any advantage of the previously mentioned subsidy programs, then you are required to fill employer a uh, self-identification form called PD27 form. We'll discuss that more in details. So subsidies definitely, definitely means changes as like more benefits is being given to employers and employees. The government wants to validate that the eligibility criteria is met and the money went to the right place. So if we go backward, you may, are, may, you may be aware about some employees subsidies programs that started maybe March 15 onward. The first one was the Canada Emergency Response Benefit or what we call it CERB. And later in September, they uh, started the Canada Recovery Benefit and still ongoing. They call it CRB. Uh, many other programs, we're not going to discuss them in this presentation, but like the Recovery Sickness Benefit, Recovery Caregiver Benefit, the Emergency Student Benefit and uh, some others. On the other side, if we look at the employer subsidies, there were two main uh, payroll, I would say, or employment income related subsidies program. We're not talking about rent or any other subsidies programs, but the main two are the CEWS and the 10% temp temporary wage subsidies. So these two programs actually, they impose new reporting requirements on the T4 slip for 2020. And I would say specifically the 10% temporary wage subsidy uh, is what caused the PD27 form also to be uh, launched. So let's shed some lights just for the sake of having an idea, oversight only about the CERB Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. That is individuals or employees related benefits not related to you as employers. But it started in March 15 and it ended September 27. 
as you may know, it was like based on four on seven claim periods. Each one of them is four week, covering four weeks, and used to have some criteria like you should have made if you are self employed five thousand dollar or more in twenty nineteen or in the past twelve months before March fifteen. You can earn more than thousand dollar gross income within the period you are claiming the benefit. And for some high level statistics, almost 8.9 million applicants in Canada applied for this program, which cost Canadians $81.6 billion. So CRB also has paid 214,000 Canadians who earned over 100K in 2019. That could be normal and fine, unless as long as they are meeting the eligibility criteria. So that shows you why, why the CRA is asking for the new reporting requirements uh, to reconcile and validate the payment are, of the benefit program are going to the right people. On the other hand, after September 26, on September 27, and still ongoing, the Canada Revenue Benefit, the Canada Recovery Benefit Program uh, started, and this program actually it has its own criteria, like you. Uh, if you make more than 38,000 uh, of employment income in 2020, then you need to rebate back uh, half or 50% for every dollar that you receive from this benefit. So uh, the main requirement is that the applicant or the individual income has to be 50% less on the average of 2019 income for the same period. So as, we, as I said, we're not going to dive deep in these two main programs. We're just shedding some over, uh, like highlight on how they work. So this is an example on, let's say in 2019 income was 26,000. So almost we can say the average per week was $500. So it goes on weekly basis comparison. So your income in 2020 must be $250 per week to be eligible to apply for the Canada Revenue Benefit. So coming to what really uh, concerns you as an employer is the first one that was uh, released by CRA, that was actually the 10% temporary wage subsidy program. So as you see on the header, it almost covers three months, like starting from March 18 to June 19 of 2020. So generally speaking, who, is, who are the employers eligible to apply for this subsidy? So it is available for eligible employers, mainly who are CCBC individuals, partnerships, who have one, one or more eligible employees. We're not going to dive also into the definition of who is eligible, who is not, and had a business number and a payroll program account as on March 18, 2020. So to give some insight on how to how how this uh, program, the 10% temporary wage subsidy uh, works, actually it's equal to 10% of the gross remuneration that you paid within this period, the period that starts from March 18 to June 19. That is of course capped or limited up to $1,375 for each eligible employee. So the maximum total for each eligible employer is $25,000 during this three months period regardless of the number of employees you are applying on their behalf. One important note, uh, you cannot reduce uh, the 10% uh, subsidy from your Canada pension plans or the EI premiums that you are remitting to the CRA. We'll come in the next slides to show more illustrative example. How, what does that mean? So you would be reducing the 10% from your income tax, whether federal, provincial, or territorial. So we cannot touch CVP or EI. So note on the side that the $25,000 limitation per, per employer uh, is not applicable to associated Canadian CCPCs companies. They are not required to share this maximum. So every employer is limited to $25,000 per, per, per employer basis. That is very important also that it is based on the pay date, not the pay period. So if your pay period began before March 18, when the program started, but you paid your employees on or after March 18, the starting date, then this remuneration that you paid is qualified for the 10% subsidy. 
On the other hand, if your pay period began or on or before the ending date, June 19, but you paid your employees after June 19, then this remuneration is not eligible or do not qualify for the 10% temporary wage subsidy. So if you are electing not to participate in both of these two programs, the form that we are going to discuss more in details later, which is the subject of this presentation and webinar, the PD27 form is not required from you. And let's say if you are electing as an employer to participate only in CWS, so you not apply for the 10% uh, uh, wage subsidy, although you could be eligible for both of them, then you can make a special election uh, in the PD27 and you uh, can put zero uh, applied under the 10% temporary wage subsidy. We will come to see that also when we come to the PD27 form section. So this is an illustrative example of the PD27 or the 10% uh, wage subsidy, how it works. So as you see, the payroll pay date falls within the period March 18 to June uh, 19, because the payroll pay date is in April, April 1st and April 15. So the gross remuneration for these two payroll dates is $16,000. As you see in this B reference, you are eligible for 10%, which means $1,600. So you are allowed to deduct this from your income tax, whether federal and provincial. So as you see the source deduction that needs to be remitted to the government on the $16,000 gross payroll is equal to the income tax 2,290 plus the CPP deduction, employer and employee, both of them. Similarly for the EI, so total deduction to be remitted to CRA is 4,454. However, you need to uh, be aware that this $1,600, which is a 10%, can be deducted only from the income tax part of the total deduction. So as you see here, the income tax after deduction went down from $2,290 to $690. And the total remittance uh, also went down from the $4,454 down to $2,854. So moving now to the CEWS, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program, shed some overview, like when it started Amar, first. Yes, sorry to interrupt you for a second. Uh, we do have a question that's come through the Q&A here. Yeah. Uh, they're just asking if you have not received any subsidies, you do not need to fill in the PD-27. And that is that is correct. Um, so just uh, and um, just wanted to take a second to answer that live. Sure, correct. Know. Yeah, if you are not taking any benefit from these two programs, you are not required to fill the PT27 form. So first when the CWS uh, was released, actually it was meant for four main periods, claim periods, as, as you see them on the right column here, starting from March 15, ending July 4. And these claim periods, actually it has own eligibility criteria to be able to apply for this program. You have to compare your eligible revenues in, let's say, that you are applying for the first period from March 15 to April 11. Then you need to compare if your revenue dropped compared to a reference period. So let's say this period we, we are examining March. So if your March 2020 revenue dropped down by 15% compared to March 19, or you have the option to compare it against January and February average for 2020. So you see, you see which one is more beneficial to you just to meet the criteria, then you can apply for the program. Same thing for the periods after April 12 until May 9, you compare the revenues that you made in April 2020 to a reference period that also you have the choice to choose between April 19 last year or the average for the current year. And goes on like that. That was the criteria or the methodology worked out for the period starting from March 15 to July 4th, then the program got extended after, and the calculation had its own different, I would say, uh, uh, calculation. We're not going to dive deep into that, but this is just an over, over, overview. So for period one to four, you must show that your eligible revenue dropped by a minimum amount to qualify for the subsidy. So as you notice, this is tied to to income, this is tied to revenue in the, uh, the CEWS. 
So any amount that you apply or you claim under this program as an employer, you have to reduce it if you are eligible for the other program, the 10% every wage subsidy. You must stick to chosen prior reference period option for all claim periods one to four. So if you chosen to compare against the current year 2020 average, January and February, then this criteria has to continue until the end of July 4. Or else you can choose to compare it against 2019. So the way how it works, this program is 75% of the qualified period wages. So let's say the qualifying wages in March 15 to April 11 is $10,000, you are eligible for 75%. That is of course subject to limitation, maximum is $847 per week per employee. And employers cannot receive CEWAs for the same period that the employee is receiving CERB. As you remember, we talked about CERB, the Canada Emergency uh, recovery benefit that is designed or given uh, to individual to the employees, we cannot as employee and employers receive it on the same time. And here is the role for the new additional reporting requirement come for the T4. So the CRA can validate if employees applied for SERB and in the meantime, let's say their employers applied for the CWS. So that's a point more related to the accounting of this uh, wage subsidy. So wage subsidy received is considered assistance income from a government Im immediately before the end of the claim period to which, to which it relates. And that's why we should be recording this for tax purposes as income for that period. So the previous slide was actually spotting the light on the first four claim periods starting March 15, ending July 4. And honestly speaking, from periods five to period 13, which is the recent one that's still going on, covering January 2021, it has its own different criteria and calculation, eligibility also. We are gonna just shed some high level uh, snapshot on the claim periods. So as you see until period 10, the end date is December 19. We still have also period 11, 12, 13, and more periods are getting introduced as time goes on. So the current reference period for uh, the same period is shown on the right side and the prior reference period is shown below. So this is how the CWA is calculated. You take the eligible remuneration paid times 75% limited to $847 per week per employee, and you add CBPEI premiums paid for employees who are on paid leave. This may not be applicable for employers, for all employers applying for this program. Of course, you have to deduct any 10% temporary wage subsidy that you apply for separately under that program. So this is the maximum 75% of wages per employee, 847. I think that is more of an example that shows how it works. So the basic Canada emergency wage subsidy is 75%, $3,388. And they are showing here in minus that they deducted the 10% temporary wage subsidy that they applied for separately. So that is the net CWS they received 3,243. So let's do kind of comparison between the two programs and how they work together. So first CEWS is tied to income. As we noticed before that we should uh, prove that the revenue has dropped up to certain, down to certain percentages compared to prior period. However, 10% temporary wage subsidy is not related to income. It's global and universal. Every employer who had a payroll account before the March 18th date, they are eligible to apply for the 10% temporary wage subsidy. So we discussed the claim periods. It's based on payroll earned in the, uh, within those claim periods. However, the 10% temporary wage subsidy, it ended in June 19. It was mainly for three months. And the treatment was different because it was paid, based on the payroll pay dates rather than uh, the, the payroll earned date for the employees between the March 18 and June, 9, June 19. 
So, so the way it worked, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. I apologize. We've got a couple of questions that have come through the chat that I just noticed here. Uh, yeah. So uh, we've got one from Patrick who's asking if the employees receiving less than $1,000 as wages in the four-week period, can the employer still apply uh, for the suit, the Canadian emergency wage subsidy? Um, and my understanding is, is yes, they, they can. can. Apply, think, yeah. Yeah. There, there's not um, a minimum amount that you have to be paying in salary in order to apply for the Qs. Um, of course, that that assumes that you're meeting the other criteria around the revenue drops. Um, and then we've got another question here, which is my corporation revenue in 2020 dropped below the qualifying percentages, but did apply for Qs. Uh, primary reason because corporation had reserves to pay director. Can I apply it retroactively? Also not sure about 2021, but if corporation does not claim Qs in 2020, would it impact my 2021 subsidies if announced? So there is a deadline for for the, uh, yeah, it did not apply. I sort of, in, I, I interpreted that one. Um, uh, so the there is a deadline for applying uh, for periods. I think it's the one through four is the, the deadline is, is January 31st, correct, Amon? Yes. Yeah. So if you're applying for those first periods, you do have a hard stop deadline of this month. So you better get your application in running as soon as possible. Um, as far as if you don't apply, will it affect any future periods? Uh, no, uh, I mean, each, each four week period is basically considered in isolation. I mean, in a little, in, there are like, it's a very complicated program. And there are some basically some carry forwards from previous year periods. Like if you qualified for the previous period, you can automatically qualify for the next period. Um, and obviously if you didn't apply in the previous period, that will not count as being able to carry forward that qualification. Uh, but if you uh, are eligible and will be applying, you need to do that for the first four periods before the end of this month, which is literally a couple days away, right? Yes, on, yeah. On the BD27, also we're going to show that in the next slide. Uh, will these slides be available, and uh, will we be going over the form itself? So we will be going over the form itself, and the slides will be available. All right. So I think with enough now on the two uh, on the highlights for the two main programs here. Let's move down to. So if you take advantage of the 10% temporary wage subsidy, you must reduce your Q's claim by all the amounts you claimed under the 10% temporary wage subsidy uh, for paid dates in specific claim periods. So if you are eligible for the temporary wage subsidy, but you only want to participate in the Q's, which makes sense because eventually both of them is having the same limit, uh, you can make a special election for your temporary wage subsidy to be equal to zero while you are applying on the Q's. As we notice, we have to put how much we claim uh, as TWS when we apply on the Q's. So if you want, you know that you are going to maximize your subsidy using one program, the Q's, which is sometimes more beneficial than the 10% temporary wage subsidy, then you don't want to go into the complications. You just put 0% applied for the temporary wage subsidy. Uh, for simplicity, if you would only like to participate in queues, you elect for that TWS to be equal to zero. So we are repeating ourselves here. We just like discuss this point. So the eligible employer should indicate 0% on also the self-identification form under the 10%. So now when we come to the, to the PD27, it's different than the earlier point. The earlier point was tackling the SKUs application. So now if you did not apply for the 10% temporary wage subsidy, you only applied for the queues, you still need to file PD27 and mention that you uh, claim 0% under the 10% temporary wage subsidy program. So that is the main <clears throat> element in our uh, presentation topic, the new additional reporting requirements for the T4 for 2020. So one important point about this, that this one is applicable to all employers, whether they benefited or applied or did not apply for any of the wage subsidies, any employer in Canada in 2020, they are expected by CRA to update the, these four red highlighted additional boxes in their 2020 T4 when they file it. 
So mainly CRA is seeking to validate payments under uh, received from individuals under the CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and similarly under the student benefit. So employers will help the CRA to validate this cross when they submit these additional four boxes. So for the tax year 2020, in addition to the regular uh, usual box 14 for employment income or code 71, uh, these four additional boxes are required from you when you are filing your T4. Uh, you have to break down the employment income uh, paid between March 15 and March May in a separate box 57. Same thing for the forthcoming period until September 26. And if you see these periods, they uh, match the period of eligibility for the SER program uh, that we have seen before. So the SERP started March 15, ended September 26. After that, the Canada Revenue Benefit started. However, income before this period and after, like from Jan 1st until March 14, or from September 26 until December 31st, uh, not required to be broken down. So at least not yet. No any instructions from the CRA. As we mentioned, employee eligibility criteria for SERP, Qs, and the student benefit loan the student benefit program are based on employment income for defined period. You just mentioned now that as an individual, you cannot earn more than $1,000 in a defined period to be eligible to claim the $2,000 CERB. So the new reporting requirements means that employers should report any payment made to their employees during these defined periods, the four ones. So an example, this the period is the date the employee got paid. So if you are reporting employment income for the period of April 25 to May 8, however, this one is payable on May 14, then you should be using the code 58. The pay date falls between May 10 and July 4. It's May, May 14. So coming to the long weighted form, the new form PD27, which is mainly related to the 10% temporary wage subsidy. And even it's called the uh, wage subsidy self identification form. So this one is new and it's required by employers for each payroll account. So each payroll account, if you have more than one, need to have its own separate PD27 form. So the purpose it's used to account for the 10% wage subsidy that was available between the three months period starting March 18 and June 19. Okay, now the deadline, as Andrew mentioned, it's better to be filed before uh, the filing the T4 form with the CRA. You still have the chance to apply for the 10% temporary wage subsidy if you did not do so in the previous period. So this form is a reconciliation form. Now, if you, let's say, deducted 10% from your source deduction remittances of CRA, then the CRA will understand this discrepancy between the source reduction remitted and the source reduction reported on the UT4. Why? We will see now in the next slide because this form will show period by period how much you deducted. So it must be filed if you claimed any Q's payment, if you claimed any 10% temporary wage subsidy, or both. However, if you did not claim any of these ones, you are not required to file. So this is your last opportunity to claim the 10% of, uh, of your payroll remittances back for the payroll made between the, these periods. Now, the way how it works, as we said, you cannot touch the CBP and the I, so you must have room in your income tax column to deduct the 10% wage subsidy. If you did not have, you can carry forward it to future payrolls. However, you need to tell CRA in Part D, this is part D in the PD27 form. When you apply the pay period dates from two, which is the pay date, by the way, not the payroll date, and you fill in the gross remuneration that we have seen in the earlier slide, the income tax deducted, CPP, both employer, employee, the EI, same thing also, and how much in the wage subsidy claimed under the 10% program. So sometimes you're claiming the full 10% because you have room under the income tax deducted. If you do not have room, you will not be able to maximize the 10%. You will be uh, deducting whatever room you have in the income tax deducted. So the way how you get benefit or carry forward this to future periods is by telling the CRA and explaining in the additional comment box in the 
part D of the PD27. As you see here, you can use this section to provide more details on how you apply the subsidy to each pay period or how or why you have not reduced your remittances. Okay, one we got one other question that's come through, uh, Ahmad. Uh, sure. So it's actually related to the T2200S. Uh, so it says, as an employee of my own incorporated company, will I be able to claim, claim the simplified home office expense, the $2 a day for up to $200 uh, on my 2020 personal tax return. Note the company uh, too does does have rent expenses, and you can't double dip. Um, so you cannot claim uh, home office as a sole proprietorship and be claiming that same home office um, in uh, the corporation. Now, if uh, if you're not claiming the home office in the corporation, then certainly you could do the T twenty two hundred S, which would be a smaller advantage than claiming the home office. Uh, but it is not reasonable to double dip on that and claim the T2200S along with your home office deduction. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Sorry. So these are the payroll uh, period dates and these are the pay dates. As you see, the pay days should fall within the 10% temporary wage subsidy defined period from March 18 to June 19. So typically this pay, first payroll period, March 12, uh, March 2 to March 15 is eligible if it is paid on March 20. And the last payroll date, May 25 to June 7, even though it's falling before the end date, June 19, but it is paid after June 12, is not eligible for the 10%. So here's an example of what we were just uh, talking about before. As you see here, each pay period is filled in, in the PD-27 form. However, this period we have income tax deduction in the red $67.89. The 10% uh, is calculated on the gross remuneration column. So 961 gross payroll we have, the 10% is $96. We don't have enough room to claim the entire 96. Then we need to clarify and tell CRA in the PD-27 form additional uh, information box that we want like to carry forward this for future period. So we don't lose it. All other periods, as you see, the 10% of each payroll is within the uh, uh, income tax deduction uh, cap. That's why we could have uh, deduct 384 fully from the payroll. So we're saying here the difference that uh, can be claimed from future source deduction remittances, the difference between $96 and $68. However, you need to request CRA to refund. You can also request CRA to refund you in the additional comment box. So that's all, Andrew. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, uh, Ahmad. Great job uh, as well. Like I said, you did an excellent job in the first time around with the with the team, and again, another great session. So uh, I right. hope everyone um, uh, found that useful. I can see we've already got a couple Q and As uh, rolling in. I can't say I'm terribly surprised. It's it's a complicated program uh, with lots of questions. Uh, so if a client did claim temporary wage subsidy and did claim the CE. CEWS, the Canadian Emergency Website, for period five and onwards only, should they still deduct the TWS from CEWS for period five and onwards? So let me make sure I understood this correctly. So the client claimed TWS um, and did CEWS for, for period five and onwards. They didn't do it for period four. Should they still deduct TWS from the CEWS for period. So they've, they've only applied for Qs in from period five onwards, but they did claim the TWS. So yes, the TWS should be subtracted from the CEWS from whatever periods you're, you're claiming it from. Um, you, should be, you should be reducing it from that. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, do you still need to fill out the table if you are submitting 0%. I assume by submitting 0%, meaning you're not applying for the TWS or CEWS. And if you're not applying for the TWS and CEWS, you do not have to uh, fill in the PD-27 form. However, even if you are not applying for 
the temporary wage subsidy or the emergency wage subsidy, we do need to still provide that information on the T4 because CRA is going to be using that to match against people who have been claiming on the CERB. Um, so we still need to break that break that down. Um, we've got another one here. Uh, if you only claim the Qs, what do you put in Part D? Um, like I, I mean, it, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, How does that table differ if only applied for uh, Qs? So uh, TWS is not something you actually apply for. The PD-27 is sort of like the confirmation um, where you've just reduced your TW or your payroll compute contributions by the TWS. Uh, if you applied for Qs, you should have been, um, it should have been reducing your CEWS by that, um, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example where you would have cues but no twos. Okay, basically, Andrew, if they applied for cues but they did not benefit from the 10% temporary wage subsidy, they still are they are still required to fill PD27 form, but they need to put zero in the 10%. Uh, and column. how much? And how much they with with help with reduce? Exactly. Yeah. So the PD27, you're still getting the TWS. You just didn't reduce your payroll remittance yet. So they're effectively going to give you a refund on the payroll remittance. And that's the point of the PD-27 is so if you were, if you'd never reduced, if you applied for Qs and you never actually reduced your payroll remittance amount by the amount you're eligible to reduce it for by the TWS, the PD-27 allows you to get basically a refund uh, on the reduction you should have received. <laughs> Clear as mud, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if client did not claim TWS and only claims you, there's no remittance discrepancies. Yeah, yes. So like that's as I just answered, I think hopefully that answered that question. So if the client didn't claim the TWS and only claim CEWS, there's no remittance discrepancies that should this, you should file the PD-27 so you can get the, the TWS uh, credit. And this is assuming you only applied for Qs. Um, I've lost track of where she was referring to. I, I think so. <laughs> um, hopefully. <laughs> um, so I'm not really sure where that question uh, was in context to. Uh, any other questions out there that we can answer? Excellent. Uh, let me just check the chat real quick. Um, and if there's nothing in the chat, which I don't think there is, nope. Um, yep. So I think we, we are good. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your, oh, we got one more that came through. Squeaky wheels. How do we get copies of the slides? Uh, so we will, we will make them available in the client portal. Um, so we're going to upload them to the free resources uh, in uh, your uh, Citrix share file account. And uh, we'll be uploading those uh, before end of day today. Um, so by tomorrow you can log in and go to the free resources and there'll be a section on um, TWS and CEWS and we'll put this slide deck in there. Um, so is the PD27 form now available in your CRA My Business account? Uh, it's definitely available. I don't, is, is it linked from the CRA My Business account, Ahmad? I, I don't think I, it is. I don't think, no. It's not, but it's available on the CRA website, actually. It, can't it. Yeah, and we should be able to download a PDF and put it in that same folder. So um, I may, maybe, Ahmad, I'll, I'll get you to do me a favor and... Uh, send me a copy of the latest PDF and I'll upload that to the client site as well. Sure, I will do that after the meeting. And, and Darlene raises a good point. You can find it by searching Google for PD27. Absolutely. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. And, uh, you know, we've got some more seminars coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. So check out our events page at cpa4it.ca slash events. Um, hopefully we're adding value and adding uh, good useful content to you guys. If there's anything in particular you'd like to see some sessions on, please do let us know. And thank you very much for your time today. And I guess that's a wrap. Thanks, Ahmad, for doing a great job. My pleasure, Andrew. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye for now.
Have a bye bye.